Hello, beloved. Welcome to the Sacred Sister Podcast, where we normalize the magic and sacralize the mundane. In this podcast, we open up dialogue on metaphysical subjects, self-healing tools, expanding consciousness, and deepening awareness. We're here to support you in co-creating a life full of healing, meaning, and magic. If you are brand new here, welcome and hello. We're so excited to have you here. If you want to know more about what's come before, season one was great for building foundations on spiritual practices. Season two, we focused on relationships, and now we're in season three. The season of the Empress, where we open deep dialogue with conscious entrepreneurs who are spearheading their sacred mission. We have an amazing lineup this season, so make sure that you subscribe if you haven't already. Now a bit about us. I'm your host, Britt, a self-study entrepreneur, personal transformation coach, and content creator. I'm prompting you to come to know the self more fully, because when we can acknowledge who we are as unique individuals, our potential to experience life gets a whole lot more interesting. And I'm your host Hannah, a Light Beyond the Veil coach, priestess and astrologist, and I guide you to unleash your source powers, leverage your inner blueprint, and sync with life's algorithm to manifest your wildest dreams. Because hey, we're multidimensional beings playing this game of life. Let's make it fun and magical. We are so grateful that you're here, and together, we're here to serve as your sacred, sacred sister. sister. Let's dive in. Hello, sacred beings, and welcome to another episode of Sacred Sister Podcast. How comfortable are you with painting and expressing yourself creatively? Is there a part of you that believes only certain gifted people are worthy of creating art and that you're probably not one of them? This was a major piece of my past. From growing up in a household that didn't necessarily encourage trying new things, to having toxic partnerships that shut down my creative process because it's not really that special when women can X, Y, and Z. Well, in today's episode, we grant full permission to express the self creatively as we open up on acknowledging the inner artist with visual artist and founder of the brave intuitive painting process, Flora Bowley. Flora is an artist, author, and gentle guide whose soulful approach to the creative process has touched thousands of lives. Blending over 20 years of professional painting experience with her background as a yoga instructor, healer, and lifelong truth seeker, Flora's intimate in-person workshops and popular online courses have empowered a global network of brave painters while creating a new holistic movement in the intuitive art world. Flora believes that creative expression is waiting to unfold within every person who is brave enough to trust, let go, and explore. And it's through this kind of heartfelt expression that truths are revealed, lives transform, and new worlds are born. From what I hear, Flora is somewhat of a local celebrity and lives and creates in Portland, Oregon. She is a dear friend of mine and an awe-inspiring teacher of mine. Since February 2018, I've had the pleasure of sharing time, space, stories, and tears with Flora at Elenario and Aya Papaya's songwriting and transformative retreat, Ancient Voices, as well as Spirit Weavers 2018 and 2019, where she offered a live painting installation collaboration with multidisciplinary creative creature Lindsay Lynx. We got to watch their painting evolve and transform over the five-day women's gathering that celebrates cultures past and present. Flora was one of the first women that I opened up to and engaged in healing conversation with after my mother passed away from a stem cell transplant cancer treatment that her body did not accept an intake. Flora also lost her mother a few years ago, and in this episode, we briefly open up on the potency of experiencing such deep loss and how it powerfully changes and enriches our ability to live fully as humans. In this episode, we find ourselves discussing the parallels that live within art creation and life itself the ways trauma and death experiences add a depth and richness that likely can't be sourced anywhere else in the same way, how we get into creative ruts and how Flora gets herself out of them, relaxing into the creative process and learning how to let it breathe, how art challenges our humanness in the realms of change, letting go, curiosity, and exploration, 
We touch on social media breaks as an entrepreneur, thriving as an entrepreneur, and The Social Dilemma, the new Netflix documentary that explores the dangerous human impact of social networking, with tech experts sounding the alarm on their own creations. We thoroughly hope that you find this episode as inspiring and rejuvenating as we did. And if you do feel some pieces of resonance, we want to hear about them. What really hit home for you? What insights did you find particularly intriguing? Let us know in the comment section of this podcast. Leaving feedback in the form of comments and ratings helps to increase searchability for Sacred Sister Podcasts so that more and more sacred beings, just like yourself, can stumble upon this podcast to receive these sacred conversations. Without much more, let's go ahead and head into Hannah's astrology segment. Enjoy! Hello, beautiful being. This is your host, Hannah, and we are now in the inner blueprint section for Flora Boli. I love doing these inner blueprints for our guests because they invite us into their soul blueprints. We can see what kind of inner archetypes do they have and how are they manifesting in their reality. And so I invite you throughout the interview to maybe recognize some of these features within Flora and, you know, just know, oh, that's her sun or that's her moon, that's her rising. (laughs) It's a fun game to play. And maybe you even recognize yourself in some of these characteristics or some of your family members. And you start noticing that we all have these 12 archetypes within us. And it's just more about how are they aligned, which ones are we focusing on, which ones are our gifts, and which ones are our challenges. So let's dive in. Flora Boli's sun is in Libra, in the second house. The sun in Libra is perfect for her. Libra is the archetype of the artist, the beauty, the peacemaker. And obviously, Flora Bali is amazing at being an artist. In the second house, it also shows this connection to Mother Earth, this connection to the physical realm, the mundane, not being afraid to use all her five senses within her art. I also love how one of her workshops is called Bloom True. And the second house is the house of really blooming growing roots, going and digging deep into the soil, allowing oneself to ground into this physical reality, embracing one's talents and gifts, and really making the best out of the material that is surrounding us. And for Flora, it's helping her in her art. Then her son is also conjunct Pluto and Mars. And Pluto and Mars are both very strong and powerful planets. Mars is the planet of desire, going after what she wants. She's not afraid to take charge and trailblaze into a whole new way of how she does things. A whole new way of doing art, right? The brave, intuitive way of painting. The Pluto is the transformation, the transformation that goes on within herself when she does that art, when she feels into that death is part of life and the dark side is a part of the beauty of life and she has the ability to combine the two, the light and the darkness of life and create art by using all her colors. Her moon is right on the cusp between Aquarius and Pisces in the seventh house. Aquarius is the rebel, right? The revolutionary. She has a workshop called the creative revolution. And Pisces is the dreamer and the unconditional love and allowing oneself to go with the flow. So I feel like she does that so beautifully, the way that she combines the rebellion, the uniqueness of how she shows up in the world at the same time seeing that we are all one and it's okay to mess up at times it's okay to make mistakes there is this beautiful feeling with flora that she has this unconditional love and forgiveness within herself that she shows to others and helps others to 
be more authentic and true to who they are because of that. And then her rising sign is in Leo, the brave heart. She's not afraid to be the star of her own life and really showing that to others, how it is to be brave, how it is to create from the heart. And that's really the beauty of Leo. Her son is in the second house, which is the chart ruler. The second house is the house of mundane tasks. So she has on Instagram, she shows what she's going through, like the adventures of her everyday life. And she also shows people behind the scenes of how she creates these paintings to really help spark that creative process within others so that they know that no matter what is happening in your life, there is a connection to the art that you're creating and to really seeing that the art is in the heart. And she has a beautiful philosophy of life that she connects so wonderfully with her art. And we'll talk about that in the interview. So I'm really excited for you to hear that. So Flora is a brave and courageous artist who is deeply connected with the physical realm and helps others access their inner creative genius by holding space for them to experience the flow of life through art. And so that is it for me. If you're interested in receiving your own inner blueprint, then you can go to my website, hannahchristensen.com. Use the code SACREDSYS for 20% off. And for now, let's sit back and let's dive into the interview. Oh, sacred sister, a kindred flame, may we light one another. From the ashes rise, oh, we rise, oh, Hello, everybody. I'd love to invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable. And just begin by feeling your breath moving in and out of your body without needing to change it. Notice if you're holding any tension in your body that you're able to soften. Letting your shoulders relax and your belly soften. That space between your eyebrows, your jaw. Letting yourself arrive into this present moment, releasing whatever busyness has come before this moment. Bringing your awareness into your heart. without needing to change anything there, just let your heart know that you're here and you're listening and you're honoring whatever it has to share with you in this moment. If you feel inspired to place a hand there, you can do that. Reminding yourself 
in this moment that you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And when you're ready, if your eyes are closed, you can go ahead and gently and slowly open them and just take a moment to notice where you are. Just take a little look around the room that you're in. Feel yourself grounded in this space, safe in this space, open to receive whatever your soul is ready to receive in this moment. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And welcome to Sacred Sister Podcast, Flora. Thank you, Britt. What a pleasure to be here with you all. Thanks for having me. Wow. That was incredible. And I want to share something that just came up. It's always one of my favorite things whenever someone leading a meditation brings us so, um, so tenderly into the present moment, especially with that open eye sort of gaze around just to see what it is around you that speaks mm -hmm. to you in the moment. And I have these dried roses right here. And I never really realized that I was so drawn to dried flowers, but dried flowers are all over my house. And it's like this idea that I don't want to constantly be buying new fresh flowers. And there's this really specific beauty that comes from the dry preserved flower. And then that made me think of your art because you're literally mm -hmm. creating something on a canvas and then it's preserving that energy for the rest of life too. <laughs> mm. Oh, I love that. And I love dry flowers too. <laughs> I actually love the, I love watching flowers go through the, the different phases as they're dying, I guess you could say, you know, like they, they start out so sort of alive and open and beautiful, but like as the petals start to drop, and I always keep them around because I just like to watch that whole process happen um, mm -hmm. because I feel like there's so much beauty in that as well. Yes. And this is what I love about you, Flora, that, that beautiful compassion for everything, for every stage, for everything in life. <laughs> It also came through in the meditation when you were saying Don't even force your breath to be a certain way. Just let it be. Just tune into your heart. Just allow yourself to feel whatever it is that wants to be felt. And I feel like this comes through in the way that you teach art as well. Not trying to force people into a box or trying mm. to make them feel like, oh, art is supposed to be this way or it's supposed to look like that. But your way of that compassionate, intuitive art is just feel into it and just allow whatever comes out to come out. And it's art because it comes from the heart. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, something that I've noticed just time and time again with my own art and by witnessing so many people um, painting as well is that when we um, try too hard, To, to make it, you know, kind of fill in the blank pretty or make sense or tell a story in a certain way. Like when we're really trying to make, force it, if you will, into a certain way, a lot of the life force and the vitality of what makes a piece of art really connect to other people in a real way um, it gets it gets sort of beaten out of the of the piece of art, whereas you know the very first exercise I usually offer in my workshops is um, having people close their eyes 
And we, I put on a, a, mu- a song that's, you know, I know is going to get people in a feeling space and we're standing and we've already done movement in our body and we've already kind of gotten uh, embodied. And then we finger paint to the music with our eyes closed. And so there's actually, it takes away that, that visual, um, you know, back and forth conversation where we, without, you know, even if we're not trying to sort of judge or, or have an opinion about what we're doing when we're making art, we just kind of do that. It's sort of just this human thing. And so when you take out the ability to even see what we're doing, what I have found is that it, it, puts us like right into a feeling space, Mm -hmm. what you were talking about, where you're just letting it be and letting it come through. And those marks and, and the expression and the energy behind what we see on the canvas when we open our eyes is always, always, always so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's, it's alive, it's raw, it's real, it's like unfiltered. And you look around the room, this is my favorite part, you look around the room and every single canvas, even though we all had the same instruction, we all listen to the same song, we're kind of using similar colors, they all look so different. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing in that moment is this you know, this, Im- this imprint of, I feel like it's our soul, you know, or, yeah. or just like who, who we are when we stop trying so damn hard to make mm-hmm. it look a certain way. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's almost like we're trying for the rest of the workshop to get back to that place. Because as soon as, <laughs> as soon as we start to open our eyes, it's like, okay, now, now it's an opportunity to work with our inner critic. Right. But, um, mm-hmm. I always say to people, you know, you can always close your eyes again. You can always do that. That's always there for you. And I've actually created whole paintings with my eyes closed, um, mm-hmm. just because it's like a, such a different experience. And, and I think there's something really, yeah, really quite real and magical about about that Mm -hmm. I love how that is such a contrast to the wine and art classes (laughs) (laughs) that is I love that you just said that I usually see that on the first night when I gather with people you know before I, I always say okay so basically what we're doing here is the opposite, you know, with all due respect, I, you know, whatever gets you painting is great, but mm-hmm. I said, well, I'm not going to tell you exactly what to do. And our paintings are not going to look the same at the end. <laughs> so, yeah. So beautiful. And I love how you combine all of that from your past to, you said you were a yoga instructor and you have really felt into your healing abilities as well and you bring all of that into your art so I want to know how did you come on that path was it always easy for you to feel intuitively into art was that a learning process what was your journey like and how did you become who you are now oh thank you for the question um well the word journey is 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 perfect because it's been it's been a long one um you know, I, I am one of those people that have, have, I've always done art and it's always been something that I've, um, found a lot of healing and just, you know, it's, it's like my happy place. And so I was like the kid that made the art. I was the high school student that hung out in the art room. I, I went to college for art. And so that, that's been a real constant thread. Uh, but it did take me Every, you know, honestly, it's kind of an interesting thing that happened is when I graduated from college and I had a BFA in, in painting and drawing and I thought, okay, well, the next thing you do is you go and get an MFA and then you, you know, keep going to college and, and learning from people. And I, and I applied to all these, well, I applied to three schools and I didn't get into any of them. Mm-hmm. It's pretty competitive to get in these painting programs. And so then I was sitting there going, oh, okay, I guess I'll just, um, you know, set up my easel in my bedroom and, uh, waitress and keep painting and, and doing this thing on my own. And, um, I really, you know, I, while I got a good foundation in an art education, it was really in those years when I was just painting alone in my bedroom that I developed, um, what became the process that I now share with other people. Mm-hmm. And, um, it really came about because, I'm just the kind of person that I'll, I always want to stay interested. I'll get, 
I don't like to word, use the word bored necessarily, but I'm really, I really thrive on uh, inspiration and, and feeling connected to whatever I'm doing. And, and so I would, you know, that was sort of my guiding force with my process was like, what keeps me authentically interested in what I'm doing? Because now, you know, I've been painting at this point, I've been painting for almost 30 years, which is so crazy. Um, but even at that point, I've been painting for a lot of years. And I just thought, how is this going to stay interesting to me? And what I realized pretty quickly was that for me, not having a plan going in um, was much more interesting than trying to execute a concept that was in my mind, which is a little, you know, more of what I learned in art school was like, we have to know why we're doing it and we have to know what it's going to be. And then we just make it happen. And, and for me, it's like, I realized, wow, what's so much more interesting to me and what, how it becomes a real practice in presence is when I let all of my expectations go as much as I can. And I just start moving the color around. I just start at try I, a lingo that I use a lot is like, try it on, see if it, see how you feel about it. Then with acrylic painting, which is what I use, you can easily cover it over. You know, I, I turn my canvas upside down all the time. I'm like, it's a, the whole process becomes about change really. And, and, and letting go, right. Because when we're changing, something's being let go and then something new is happening. That's sort of the, the essence of change. And, and so I just started painting in that way. And it became this process that I realized was such a big metaphor for living. Um, it's not why I started painting that way. It just sort of became what it was about eventually. And so, um, you know, I never really even thought about teaching it until about 11 years ago. And then, you know, that I had been painting for 15 some years at that point professionally and, and making that my career. And I was, I was at a place where, being alone in my studio and making paintings and selling them and, and doing that whole, what I thought was my dream job, um, actually had me feeling kind of, um, lonely, you know, kind of, uh, kind of isolated and, and feeling a little bit of a lack of purpose. And so I don't need to tell the whole story about how I started teaching, but when I did, it was like all these parts of myself got to come into the same room. So I was you know, I would lead people through yoga and we would do dance and I would play music and we would do writing and, and painting and then really getting into all of the ways in which this process was really a way of practicing ways of being alive. And that's the stuff that I find the most interesting. It's like, it's fun to make paintings and that's always kind of a, a good like lure in for people like, oh, painting, doesn't that sound fun? Cool, let's do it. And then you realize, oh, we're actually like, this is a transformational process. This is a healing process. And so over the last 11 years of sharing this process with other people, it's just become more and more rich in those ways. Um, and I've, you know, I keep learning about it, even though I've been doing it for so long. It's like, there's layer upon layer <laughs> of, of realizing like, oh, that's about life too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and it's interesting. I just, um, I'm just in the very end uh, process of, of writing a book that's called The Art of Aliveness. And mm. Uh, I keep calling it a book book because there's no pictures and my other books have like a lot of pictures and they're like about <laughs> painting and they're colorful. And this is more of like, a, I guess you would call it like a self-help book um, where it's just words. And so it's really um, forced me to get even more clear and dig even deeper into all of the ways that the creative process um, informs and can help us to uh, learn these lessons that are that are really useful in life. And that's mm. basically what the whole book is about. I, I kind of say like, you don't even need to paint because I've been doing it for 20 years and now I can just share these little gems that I've, you know, gathered over, over the years. And of course I want everybody to paint, of course, but you know, it's <laughs> like, it's like, let me just share these little bits of wisdom. And, and, and I love, I love that it's never ending. You know, I mm. feel like this is a, something that for the rest of my life, I'm going to still be having aha moments around how creativity and, and life like create this beautiful infinity loop of, mm. of informing each other um, in, in so many ways. So 
Yeah. Yes. A um, little bit about the journey. <laughs> oh my gosh. Just to comment on a striking gem that you just touched on, which was one of the deep pieces of medicine with me when I began working with your stuff online is that one of the things that I initially appreciated about your process so much is like this integration of layers and like the changeability and the flexibility. And, you know, sometimes I thought that you had something so brilliant on the canvas and then you would just like, like wipe over it with another <laughs> layer of paint. And I'd be like, <gasps> <laughs> and then, and then I had like canvases sometimes like I'm sure I'll mention this in the intro, but I, I come from like crippling creativity, like mm. shut down and like never allowing myself to paint. Oh, actually this is the first thing I ever allowed myself to paint. It's right behind me. Oh. And, uh, And yeah, just really giving myself that permission to do it for the first time. And then shortly after that, I met you and I was like, oh my gosh, like I didn't even know your art. I didn't even know you were an artist at Ancient Voices until like days and days later. And then I came home and looked up your stuff online and I was like, not only is she an artist, she's like the most inspiring artist I've ever, ever seen her work. So I was like sitting here doing my own first pieces of art and that moment came where you were talking about layers and stuff. And I would see you just kind of like going over. And I realized that I have like in the way that you were saying about how it translates into real life, I realized what a control freak I am and also how much I am so terrified of change. Yeah. And I started letting myself like really slowly do thin, thin layers so I could just see what was underneath still, which was a beautiful yeah. thing. But then sometimes that huge edge can get pressed when you really just allow yourself to like delete something, but delete something or paint over something because it's not deleting, it's just adding to it. And yeah. then you can also integrate like even more beauty on top of that. Yeah. And oh, I yeah. I feel like it's like this, especially resonant for me at this point right now, it was moving me to tears because, you know, never in my life would I have imagined that my mom would pass away and then my dad would pass away 20 months later. And it's this changeability that I can either allow myself to like be destroyed over it because I know people can spiral into really dark paths after immense loss like this, or I can see it as this, you know, beautiful easel that I'm not knowing this change is coming, obviously, but, you know, allowing yourself to really feel into a different perspective Mm. with the process. Mm. Absolutely. I love so much of what you just said. Um, Actually in the, in the book I'm writing, uh, I tell the story of, of my own mom's passing um, in the chapter that's called embrace the layers. And yeah. (laughs) And it, and it really, and there's so much I could say about that, but, you know, it's, I kind of make the point that, you know, when, when you, when you meet people that have really been through things like real loss and real trauma and real, whatever it is that they've experienced in their life, um, there's a, and if it hasn't taken them down, like you said, if it hasn't brought them down to a place where, um, they've never recovered from that. If they have moved through it in a way and uh, harvested the gems that come truly from those experiences, the, there's a, there's a depth, um, in those people. And, um, you actually can't really get that depth unless you have been through some things. Um, and I feel like it's a, it's very much a, a mirror to the painting process because, my paintings that go through a lot of layers, like they don't, they they don't come together all magically and easily in like a couple layers. They actually, like I have paintings that who knows how many layers, like these canvases are so heavy, right? <laughs> they have gone, they've changed, they've changed again and they've changed again. And it's because I, there was some element of um, 
you know, struggle or like just really trying to figure it out. I tried on these different ways. Those almost always are my most interesting paintings in the end, because they, like you said, when you cover a layer over, it's not, you're not getting rid of it. It's still there. It gives it the depth. It gives it the texture. Mm -hmm. Um, If you leave part of that layer showing, it gives you the contrast of what came before. It's like a little window into what came before. And so it's really where the beauty ends up um, like emerging from your process of like, wow, I went through this and then I went through this and I went through this and I, and I still kept going, you know, I still kept going and, and, and I'm here to tell you about it. (laughs) And, and I don't know, those are, those are the people honestly in my life that I'm most attracted to that I find most inspiring, most resilient. Um, And I just love that we get that, that this particular painting process gives us a place to practice it that's really quite safe you know it's really it's just it's really just paint it's just paint on canvas so it's not like really that big of a deal but it 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 does feel like a big deal when you're in the process and it gives you that real life experience of of you know letting i have this phrase where i say you know be willing to let go of things you like to make room for things you love you know, because so often you, you're at, you know, I see this happen all the time in my workshops and, and, and my own process as well as you'll, people are like, yeah, it's pretty good. I, it's okay. Yeah. And it's like their voice is like, hi, you know, and they're like, and what's going on in their mind is, um, I don't love it, but I'm afraid I can't do any better. Yeah. And so there's this subtle settling mm-hmm. that happens. And I feel like that happens so often in our lives too, is that we just get to these places where we're like, well, it's okay. Like, I'm going to just, I'm just going to be with this, you know? And, and sometimes in life that's perfect. Sometimes that's exactly what we need to do. I don't mean to say like, you always need to keep, you know, trying to, to go to something greater, but I think it's, it's also how we start to feel less and less alive is when we make a lot of those kind of compromises and they start to compound in a way where all of a sudden we go, oh my God, I'm not actually living a life that I want to be living Mm -hmm. uh, because I made so many of those compromises. And so again, the painting process gives us this opportunity that's really safe to practice letting go of something that's sort of like eh feeling and and seeing what's on the other side of that, you know, and, and maybe what's on the other side of that is that it gets worse before it gets better. That's <laughs> super common, you know, yeah. but, but it's this idea of like perseverance and sticking with it and like not giving up and, and choosing again, you know, choose that's, that's another, you know, mantra for me in this process is just, okay, all of that stuff happened now choose again, like come back to this moment. What are you going to do next? And if you just keep doing that, you know, my belief, and this is based in seeing it many, many times over, is that it will it will work out eventually. And I mean, my favorite thing is on the last day of a workshop, seeing everybody just in awe of what they created. They're like, mm-hmm. I can't even believe I did that. And I'm like, I know, right? Like, that's really amazing. And it's because you didn't give up. You didn't settle for it's okay you kept going and that was hard (laughs) in that moment, but look what happened. And then painting gives us this really cool, like uh, tangible thing to look at at the end that shows us where, you know, it sort of gives us this gift, you know, where we can actually, if we want to, we can put it on the wall and we can be reminded of that whole process of how, okay, when I just kept going, you know, this is what happened eventually. I love how you compare art with life. That is so beautiful. And it's so true because, you know, by the end of this life, when we cross over, we look back and it's almost like a painting. Yeah. We look through all these different memories and everything and we're like, okay, what have I created in this lifetime? And do we want to settle with, no, was pretty good or do we want to say wow that is amazing I can't believe I just created this yeah I love that and it's like and it's going to be hard too you know I think that's like such a big piece of this is that it's you know that and you know Britt what you're saying with you know these losses you've experienced recently it's like like it's hard being alive you know and it's hard being human and that's also 
where the richness happens. It's like mm-hmm. through loss, we, we realize how much we love, you know, and, and, it, and it, it all, I mean, losing my mom was, was the hardest thing I've gone through by, by far. And simultaneously the thing that has taught me the absolute most about being alive and yeah. about my heart. And, you know, I never, like I, if I hadn't had that loss, I couldn't even understand where you are at right now, you know? And, and while I don't completely, cause our stories are different, my heart understands where you're at. Like I am, you know, there's a part of me that's like, I've been in those rooms. I'm going to start crying now too. Um, like I've, I've experienced those firsthand. And so what that gives me access to is compassion for people that are in those places now. It's like this understanding that you honestly don't get unless you've experienced it yourself. And, and, and through that, we, our hearts just get bigger and, and more capable of, of holding the, the full range of what it is to be alive, the, the absolute joys and these deep sorrows. And it's like, I mean, that's what I want with this, you know, one precious life, if you will. Like I want to, I want to feel it all. I want to have the capacity to feel it, it all and not to pick and choose and, and numb out. Cause I just don't think that really works. I don't think if we're, if we don't let ourselves go into these really challenging places, we don't, we don't get to go to the other side either mm-hmm. because I really feel like we're just, when we're experiencing like say grief fully, what we're doing is we're practicing being honest with ourselves, right? right? Where we're just practicing being honest. This is just what's happening. And if you're blocking it out, or you're pushing it down or you're numbing it out, you're not being honest with what's actually wanting to be felt. Mm -hmm. And so then when you are in, you know, a joyful situation, it's like, you know, you haven't been being honest with yourself. So how are you going to be honest with that? Right. That was kind of a, I've had that sort of, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, just that, like how it's all just about being honest with, with what is true. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I love the that the conversation is taking this turn. We actually now on the morning that we're recording this, we released our previous episode with Jules Acre and this morning I woke up knowing that before the episode goes live, I have to put like another minute of content into the beginning of the episode because I was talking about how my dad had passed and then in my head I started thinking don't put a damper on this episode. Why are you making it so deep and dark and hard and stuff? And then I was thinking like, yeah, but why is it deep and dark? And there's a part of myself that doesn't even want to address this stuff on a public forum with people because I feel like maybe people aren't going to want to sit with it or aren't going to want to handle it. And I think that this is, I told Hannah and I mentioned in the episode too, like, this is a part of, in my perspective, like a part of our responsibility as community leaders to be helping people gently get pressed to this edge. That's like helping getting as comfortable as we can with sitting with people who are going through a hard time and not feeling like we have to people please them or fix it or make it better or, Oh, it's at least, you know, this is all, you know, happening for a reason and like nullifying the deep despair that someone's going in and just being able to sit with them in the discomfort and being like, I don't have any words. Those have been the most comforting pieces that people can offer me in this time is the people that are like, I don't have any words for you. I just can sit here with you. It's like, cause we're not looking for someone to give us an answer or make things better because the only answer we want is like for the parent to be back or for the loss not to have happened. And no one can give us that. So we don't need to try to make things better, but I feel like what you were just describing too, is a beautiful piece of the shadow work that we're able to do with just sitting with the stuff that is getting suppressed because you don't have to, you know, go through death and loss in order to assess your traumas and like the hardships that you've been through. All of us have hardships that we've been through. And just by sitting with those, being honest with ourselves and giving them the time, space and energy that they desire it, it is such a massive growing uh, potential, like you were just saying, that we're able to feel yeah. into and, and it'll just like expand our 
ability to, to live and be alive and thrive by allowing ourselves to go to those depths too. Mm-hmm. For those of us who live, you know, in the States or in the West or in these cultures that the, <laughs> the way that we handle like trauma and grief and loss mm-hmm. is it, we have a lot, a lot of uh, evolution, I guess I'll just say um, in those ways. Like it's this idea that, okay, you know, you can grieve for this certain amount of time and then you need to get over it. And and it's, it's really, um, it's really sad that that's yeah. what we've become accustomed to. And, and, you know, when you were speaking just now, I just thought, you know, we got to get comfortable with what's uncomfortable because look at the world we're living in right now. Yeah. It's like, yeah. this is not, I don't, I have a feeling that it's going to get harder before it gets easier. Yeah. And, you know, we're going through a collective trauma right now with, Mm -hmm. you know, the pandemic and out here in the West, the fires and all of the hurricanes and the racial justice revolution. I mean, it's just, it's compounding and, and we're being forced as a, as a, as a people right now to really, um, become more resilient. And, um, and I think the more, like you said, I love how you said as community leaders, we need to, you know, push push people into that space. And, and I think, I don't know, for, for me, it feels like a relief when people can just talk about that stuff in a way that, um, is maybe helpful or, or healing or, or just real, um, versus, you know, having it have to be all, you know, love and light all the time. Like, I think, uh, we really need to move it. We need to broaden the spectrum of what is okay to experience as a human being and, um, and, and, and get, yeah, get more comfortable in those spaces. And it's like painting with darker colors, right? Yeah. Because the emotions of our life are like colors and just being comfortable with painting with some of the darker. Yeah. When, when I do that, when I do that eyes closed exercise, I was telling you about in the beginning, I, I usually make people use really dark colors for that. Mm. Um, like blacks and blues and, um, and there's, it's interesting to, to notice the resistance that oftentimes new painters have to using black or using these darker colors. But what the reason that I do it is because once that layer dries, we've created this beautiful, rich foundation to create contrast on top of. And so then the next thing I usually do is have them bring out the whites and the lights. And sometimes we do like writing on top of it or mark making. And then they're just like, Oh, Mm -hmm. wow. Look at how it pops, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, if you never would have gone into that far end of the value spectrum, if you will, <laughs> um, you never would have given yourself the opportunity to create that kind of contrast. And and what most people do when they're starting as new painters is they stay, my friend Lynx calls it midtown. <laughs> they stay in midtown where all the colors they're using are right in the middle of the, ve- they're, they're not light and they're not dark. They're just in the middle. Yeah. And, um, and I think that is also such a metaphor where mm-hmm. it's like, you know, we want to, why do we do that? Because it feels on some level, it feels comfortable Yeah, to stay in the middle. You know, it's like, I think we can all relate to that feeling of like, well, I don't really want to get too extreme. I don't want to, you know, speak out in this way, or I don't want to be too crazy. I mean, especially as women, right. It's like, I don't want to be too, too much too whatever. And so I'm going to just stay in midtown But then in Midtown, we start to not feel alive, you know, again. And, and and mm -hmm. so like letting ourselves go into these extremes and and, like realizing that contrast is the spice of life. Contrast is crucial. Mm -hmm. It's, it like brings things, brings everything alive. I love that you just said that because how I like to see it is, you know, how you have the heartbeat or, you know, the frequency, the waves, Mm. And they go around the middle path, which is the zero line. And you go up and down, up and down, up and down. And when it goes to D, that's when the person died. Oh, right? my gosh. Yeah. So when we are completely in the middle with every single thing that we do, and we always have the complete perfect balance, we're dead. <laughs> <laughs> we're totally dead inside, you know? So, like, you know, having these, like, ups and downs are part of what makes us alive. And we can choose of, like, how far we go up and down, how fast we yeah. do that, you know. Um, but if we go, like, through, like, a nice wave, like, up and down, and 
it's it helps us and it, it can be yeah. really relaxing at the same time too but also very bringing up that depth and also whenever we go through some sort of hell we go into a brighter heaven afterwards mm -hmm. that's what i've realized it's like mm -hmm. we're unlocking a new sort of heaven after that mm -hmm. because we've unlocked a deeper sort of hell before yeah. so that we like bounce back the equal opposite of the action that we took as the reaction, you know, kind of yeah. when you think of the frequency waves mm -hmm. and we go in and unlock even higher levels of heaven. Mm. And yeah, it's so that. fascinating. And I love that you just mentioned that where, when we are in the middle pass in that, in that mediocre kind of life where we're like, yeah, it's kind of good. <laughs> like, we're not actually alive. Right. And, and those are also the people, I mean, that might be their life lesson, mm -hmm. exactly what they need in that time. Maybe they were super extreme in their past lives. And now this lifetime is for them to be like, you know, I'm just going to take it easy in this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And yeah, that's I think cool, it's, you know. Yeah, I think as long as like, they're happy, as long as we're like, you know, yeah. this is I enjoy my life, and when I yeah. die, when I cross over, would I regret something? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. always like I've been traveling a lot these past months. I went to meet my family in Germany, and I went to California, and then I uh, went with Britt to New Mexico for the celebration of life uh, for her daddy. And just these times when I was flying, I always get confronted with this thought, what if I cross over? Mm -hmm. Every single time. It's funny because, you know, it can happen in car accidents and it's so much like more likely, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I go into the car, I never thought, think of that. But <laughs> if I'm in a plane, I always get confronted with this thought, what if I'm going to die? And it's so healing for me to think that because I always go through my life and think, what would I regret something that I didn't do or that yeah. I'm not doing? And that really brings us back to this moment of like, what is really important? Mm. What is it that mm. I really, have I told my loved ones that I love them? You know, have I, do I hold any grudges with someone that I want to make sure all, you know, lose ends are tied, you know, all these like different things when you think about that, it can be so healing to just live like that on a regular basis. Mm. And the only thing that I've realized what I would regret is not sharing the experiences that I had and not sharing everything that I've downloaded through my guides and all of those things that have happened to me. And then I realized, wow, of course. And that kind of catapulted me to start writing my book because then I was like, okay, this is what I need to do. Because this is literally the only thing that I would regret if I died now. Mm -hmm. And then so, it kind of it, it kind of takes you to the next step of like, what are you meant to do? You know? Yeah, I love those. There's the programs of like living a year as if it was your last year of life. Mm -hmm. um, I think that kind of thing is is so powerful. And I just had the experience recently. I was traveling when the fires happened here in Oregon, and um, my housemate was here and she said, you know, we might need to evacuate. And, you know, what do you want me to take? And so there I, you know, I'm far away mm -hmm. having to think of telling her what to take from the house. And it didn't thankfully end up coming to that, but I came home and she had put little sticky notes on everything, like mm -hmm. basically photos and like my hard drives, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but it was like, it's just such an interesting thing to be like, wow, okay. Like, what is it? You know, what is, what are the most important, like tangible objects? But then it also just puts it in perspective of like, who, you know, yeah, you can kind of evaluate your whole life. Like, what have I not said or what have I, what do I need to say? All those things. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I think that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I've been, um, you know, in taking a lot of captions that people have been posting of being nearly evacuated or evacuated. And then, you know, their houses maybe have burned, maybe haven't burned, but it's so fascinating that every single person that I've read, and actually, you know, a lot of them too, uh, Yvette from Ancient Voices and Elenario mm -hmm. from Ancient Voices too, yeah. uh, that they grab photos 
yeah. and that they grab seeds to rebuild in the future. And I think that just speaks to us on such a deep level, how, how much like memories and nostalgia and like re um, like reawakening times, feelings of times past and just how powerful those are and how like just living your life in a way that you're making those memories to be having in the future so that you can be like, for me, it's this feeling of, of, uh, fulfillment and a feeling of satisfaction with life that I know that I'm taking action that are making memories that are going to be enriching my life for the rest of my life. Because what I'm finding since the last year and a half of losing my mom is that I still get that same feeling that I'm like right next to her, that her spirit Mm -hmm. is with me, that it's alive inside of me whenever I'm, you know, opening up on a really deep story or sharing some hilarious memory that involves her. And it's some, some real deep piece of magic that I feel like we're able to, to feel into as conscious humans, whenever we really take into account, like just how powerful we are as humans Mm -hmm. and how we can literally recall the past and Mm -hmm. how time and how time is like not linear, how time and space literally doesn't matter. And I, do you know the movie Coco? Coco? Oh yeah. You had me watch that one. (laughs) I love that. In Coco, it's all about, you know, the afterlife and where the people are, where the souls are moving into. And they can visit the 3D world and be with us as long as their memories are being shared, Mm -hmm. as long as their stories being shared. And I feel like this is it's so deep on such a, like, I feel, I watch a lot of Disney movies with my daughter and a lot of kids movies in general. And there's such a depth to them. If you want to look into it, there's Mm -hmm. such a spiritual truth Mm -hmm. in not all of them, but you know, in certain ones. And with Coco, it's like, because we are diving into those memories and we're sharing the stories of the people that we love, this is how they can still be with us Mm -hmm. in this world. And otherwise they're being forgotten in this world. So they can't come into this world as spirits anymore. Mm. And so it's this beauty. And I feel like back in the day, it was very normal that we just keep telling the stories of our ancestors. And now we kind of have forgotten to keep telling the same stories, but I want to like recreate that for my daughter and tell her the stories so that she can tell the stories and, you know, just, yeah, keep just con- keep it going. Mm-hmm. And I love how we just like talk so much about life, but it's about art at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I love that. Art. I I love that we're opening on such a deep level. I was just thinking of that too. I was like, wow, we haven't talked about like art, art <laughs> in like, <laughs> like 15 minutes or something, but it's a beautiful piece of this process and how our life experiences are able to inspire this. It's like art is such a mystery. The art mm-hmm. of, of paintings and photography and music. It's like, they're so integrated into us on such a deep level that especially now in COVID times, it's like, we're not having a lot of things that are uh, letting us interact with art as much as we regularly were concerts and festivals and all these things that people were able to go and have their art outlets. A lot of those are not available to us at this time. So we need to be like, hopefully bringing those things into our like little houses and feeling into making the art and listening to music and dancing in our houses and Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's intense, but we've got to, this is like, I feel like where the permission slip is put super loudly into our own (laughs) hands. That's like, what kind of life are you wanting to live? Are you, Mm -hmm. you know, what kind of things do you value? And when they're not readily available for you, are you taking a conscious effort to like keep them in your life and bring them into your own life? Well, I think there's this, you know, we're, there's the, been this paradigm that's been really strong around, um, who gets to be an artist in this lifetime where it's like, oh, these, these few people get to be artists with a capital A and everybody else just consumes their art. 
And Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember going to Burning Man, you know, for the first time um, many years ago and, and really starting to get on this deeper level, this idea of, of participation. That's like one of the, the ethos is, is, is like radical participation and realizing like, Oh, I could go up on that stage and dance right now. Like I could spin fire or I, you know, whatever, whatever the thing is where I don't have to, you know, I've always been, like I said, I've always been a a creator when it comes to visual art, but there's other kinds of art that I, you know, music and, and things where I've always, I, you know, had much more of a hesitancy and, and sort of thought, well, that's not, I'm not good at that. I don't have that talent, you know, quote unquote. And then realizing, oh wait, like, it's actually not about that. It's yeah. about, it's about the feeling that I get in myself when I'm generating, when I'm being creative, when I'm in action, when I'm participating again, it's a feeling of aliveness. And so it doesn't matter how the song sounds coming out of my mouth. It doesn't matter how the dance looks. It's about, you know, letting ourselves be in motion. Um, you know, that's, I, I always love how the word emotion is like, it's like in, mo- it's like we're in motion around it. And, and that there doesn't have to be this line in the sand where the artists are on one side and the, and the, you know, audience is on the other side. Like, you know, I think, you know, so many cultures and, and tribal communities, they, they know this, they like everybody dances, everybody sings. It's like, yeah. they all grieve together in these ways. And, and it's super integrated into just being a human yeah. and it does, there's not this big separation. And so that's, I feel like that's been part of my maybe mission in this lifetime is to um, just be a, a remind, a reminder for people and, and a permission giver um, around like you, you know, we are all creative beings. We, we came in with our first breath in a, it was creation that created us. And that, and like, that's like part of the deal is that we get that. And whether or not we decide to flex those muscles is up to us, but like Mm -hmm. realizing, and I think that COVID has reminded me of this when you were talking about just COVID and people being home and isolated and so, you know, I have to say like my e-courses have really been doing well during this mm-hmm. time because I think so many people are craving something meaningful. Mm-hmm. They, they want to be engaged in a thing that feels meaningful and making art is that. That's one of those things. And so um, I, I, I think that's been one of the silver linings of this time is that I think a lot of people have come to um, either, you know, deepen the practices they've already had, or maybe start new ones. Um, You know, I feel like that's happened with me and like gardening, you know, it's like, oh, I suddenly had time and I was home. So I planted a big garden for the first time, Mm. you know, and and people, you know, picking up art supplies for the first time. I think it's just, uh, it's super important, you know, And, and creativity, like we've been talking about this whole time, gives us these ways of practicing uh, letting go and and being present and listening to our intuition, becoming more resilient. Like it's all the things we need as humans in this moment in time where we're having a massive change of how we live on the planet. You know, it's like, or we need to anyways, <laughs> we're, we're sort of at this place where it's like, okay, we really need to like think outside the box, like the way that things have been going are in many ways are no longer working. And Mm -hmm. so what, what do we need in order to reimagine and recreate a new way of living on the planet? We need creativity. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to think in new ways. We need to um, try things on and see if they work and, and and be innovative. And so I love, you know, I, I often will, you know, we can think about painting as like, Oh, I'm painting a picture. Or we can think about it as, oh, I'm literally practicing for being in the new world. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> totally. yeah. I like to think of it on that scale. I, I really, well, I, I don't just think of it that. I believe in that. You know, yeah. I believe that we need to, we need to dig deep and and come up with new ways of being, and and our creative practices give us give us a way to, um, to strengthen those muscles. I love this so much. Um, I just want to mention this the whole time while you were speaking. It's like coming into my mind. I need to talk about this because 
when you say all these words, like we need to think outside of the box, we need to be innovative, we need to reimagine our new world. That's literally Aquarius. That's the age of Aquarius that we're moving into. That's the archetype of Aquarius, the innovator, the rebel, you know, the liberation of the old. And when we look into the opposite sign, that's Leo. And Leo is the elite and looking at and putting people on a pedestal and looking at right. people be like, oh, those are the stars. Those are the artists. I could never be like that. Mm-hmm. And Aquarius like, hey, we're all stars. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. You have something special like every single one of us allow yourself to express that on such a deeper level. So I love that you just mentioned that. And then additionally to that, we are in such a potent time right now because we're moving into age of Aquarius, but we're still in age of Pisces as well. We're in the cusp between the two Mm -hmm. and age of Pisces. Pisces is art, music, painting, feeling, spirituality, like all of that, what we were just talking about, the forgiveness and that, just enjoying the journey without needing to focus on, am I being productive? Am I efficient in this? Is this going to be good enough? Because the opposite of Pisces is Virgo. That can be super judgmental and seeing like black or white, is that going to be something that's worthy of being shown to the world? Or is that, does, is that worthy of my time? And Pisces is like, let me just enjoy the journey and mm. flow with it. Mm. So I love what we just talked about. It's like literally those two Pisces and Aquarius energy, those two ages that we're meant to combine and allowing ourselves to go off the flow and at the same time reimagine what is possible for us. Mm, I love that seeing through that lens that you have. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Flora, when you were talking just a minute ago too, it's like, obviously so many downloads are happening for both of us whenever we're having this conversation. It's so beautiful and so potent, so deep. We can feel through witnessing you, how connected you are to your process, how much you've experimented with your own process, how deep you've allowed yourself to go, how curious and experimental you've been. And it reminds me of that last day that we were all in Hawaii and we all met up at that restaurant and we were all kind of just sharing our life experience and our stories. We were there with Amy and you and I went over to the dock and we were like watching the sunset you were talking about your books that you've written and I was just so enthralled by you, even though I still hadn't seen any of your art. I was like, dang, this woman's like on it. She's like so led and so called and she's been acting in her path. So in such an aligned way, it was one of the most potent conversations I had had in my life up Mm -hmm. until that point. And I remember just watching, you know, this, this majestic sunset on the horizon of the Mm -hmm. ocean, watching it go down and having this conversation with you. And the place that I was at in my life was still so attached to like, but what is my life path and what is it going to look like? And how am I going to make a living? And when you concern yourself with those types of things, you're not even necessarily allowing yourself to sink into like the beingness of what your sacred purpose could even look like. And I remember Mm -hmm. talking to you about finances and stuff, because I come from uh, quite like a poverty childhood and just, you know, having a lot of those money wounds still ingrained into me. I was like, but how do you make a living? And what you said, like rocked my world to the core. You were like, you don't even need to think about that whenever you're living a life in alignment, like that stuff just comes. And that was the (laughs) first time that concept ever came to me. I was just like, Mm. she seems crazy, but she seems seems also like she's speaking from experience. So I wanted to know if you could just just touch on that for anyone that's listening right now who who Mm. could be in such disbelief that like truly living a life in alignment and feeling into your sacred purpose, like can open those doors for you that, that show to you that you're going to be provided for just by feeling Mm. into the magic of you. Yeah. Well, you know, I've always been, you know, also, you know, as much as I believe in the magic, I also believe in, uh, 
I'm pretty grounded. You know, I'm sort of a very like Midwestern like person (laughs) at the core. And so for me, what really worked as I was developing my career was that I, you know, I, I had a, a waitress and I, and I had my bills paid in a way that I knew where they were coming from. And, and, but I never got a nine to five job. I never went so far into giving up of my time and energy in a way that I knew I wasn't going to create space in my life to be in my creative flow and in that space where I'm not trying to make money in that space. I'm ne- I, I'm just trying to like allow it to unfold. And so I'm always like, don't, you know, you know, have your, don't, I think what I see, let me try to say this in the better way. Like what I see often is that people want to so quickly make a living off of their passion, Mm -hmm. you know? So they discover painting, for example, and they're like, oh my gosh, I could make a living off of painting. Like I'm going to quit my day job and like go for that. And all of a sudden you've added this layer of pressure, financial Mm -hmm. pressure on top of what is that magical thing in your life. Mm -hmm. And so the very essence of that is going to change your relationship to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's like, as people are starting out, you know, you know, I used to have this formula. Okay. I'm going to work. Um, I'm going to make $50 an hour. I mean, this was back in the day, so it's probably things are a little different now, but I'm going to make $50 an hour and I'm going to work 10 hours a week only. And so I taught yoga, I waitressed and I was a massage therapist and all of those things I did made me about $50 an hour. And so I, I lived really simple. I lived in community houses, I didn't need that much money to to live because I was pri- all of those years I was prioritizing my art. Mm-hmm. And I knew I needed to create like I needed to have that space like big amounts of space in order to develop myself as as a painter. And so and not to say that formula is going to work for everybody, but that's how I did it and eventually I started making money off my paintings and like I slowly like I let the waitressing go and then I eventually let the massage therapy go and eventually let let the yoga teaching go and you know fully was in my you know full-time painting career um, and then it's really when I think something that I think about a lot is that when I, when I started to share it, when I really stepped into that place of like, I'm going to just not have this be about me painting paintings. I'm going to have this be about me opening doors for other people to remember their creativity and to learn these skills and to connect with themselves in that way. That's when my abundance really kicked in. Mm -hmm. That's like when all of a sudden I had plenty and I felt like I was super in the flow with money and um, I didn't have to worry about that stuff as much anymore it was when I started sharing it, which was, I just feel like that's really interesting. So it's, it's that idea of like when we're in service or when we're doing anything that is for the good of all that I feel like there is this thread of abundance, um, that sort of opens oftentimes, um, in, in those spaces. And again, this is, it's not like a formula that fits for everybody, but I think, yeah, like cover your bases and don't have to be stressing about making money off of your passion right away. And like, let yourself, um, have that just play open. You know, I think in the creative process, it's so important to, to give yourself time in the studio where you're not really trying to make anything. Mm -hmm. You're just letting yourself experiment and play and get weird in there and like try new materials and paint with your feet and close your eyes and do all this weird (laughs) shit. Like that's when the breakthroughs happen, you know, and it's, it's the same in life. It's like giving yourself uh, you know, I think on when we're on vacation, like oftentimes we have ideas or we're just in the shower and it's just this open kind of space. It's like in those spaces, we connect to source and inspiration. And I mean, this circles right back to the where we very first started in this conversation around tr- like trying so hard. And when yeah. we try so hard, oftentimes we just beat the life out of stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like yeah. it's just what you should try so hard to do is to give yourself space to not try so hard. (laughs) (laughs) I'll just end with that. (laughs) Totally. I want to say too, thank you for that distinction because I had been thinking about it the entire time. I don't want to put that out there about, you know, focusing on 
making money super fast. I know that in the yoga community, that can be something too. And it adds this pressure where people love doing yoga so much. They want to go to yoga teacher training and then start teaching yoga and making a living off teaching yoga, which is, can sometimes be a very stark contrast stark truth to realize like, Oh, I think I have to be teaching 37 classes a week to, (laughs) to be making a living. And then it's like, they get burned out. Yeah. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. And I, I would love to know more about the way that you operate on a daily basis in your business, because you were just mm. talking about how you don't like to have a plan, how you don't like mm-hmm. to go into it with a schedule. And I feel the exact same way. I'm so excited to see your birth chart, by the way, because I feel so much that that Pisces go with the flow kind of feel from you. Yeah. Um, but I have that in, within me too. And I'm having a really hard time. I'll just be honest to stay consistent with, you know, social media or like to just like planning a hand ahead and scheduling. We just had uh, a guest uh, Jules Aki on la- in the last episode and she's amazing at planning and scheduling and she has a lot of Capricorn and Saturn in her so I know that she's like that's part of her inner blueprint but I would love to hear from you like how do you do it how can you bring <laughs> that flow into your business and still allow it to like flourish so beautifully Mm, that's a great question. Well, I'm I'm definitely not a planner. I'm probably the opposite of your last guest where I love to be in the moment. And I and I think what serves me is that I am a hard worker and I am um a visionary. And so I I, I get visions and I and I'm able to manifest things um, because I work hard, you know, and, and I, I don't expect things to happen magically. How it happens and the sort of like pathway there is pretty um, circuitous, I guess. I think I have, I, I would say I'm on the spectrum of having ADHD and, and feeling a little like I get distracted really easily. Um, I... I love my favorite thing is to have a day where I don't have anything scheduled. <laughs> like that is my idea of a, of, it doesn't mean I'm not going to get things done. And yeah. it doesn't mean I don't have like a to-do list scrawl somewhere that I'm aware of, you know, it's like, I have my shit together, but I also don't, I can, I can let it happen in a way that is organic. And that's mm-hmm. how I paint, you know, I, I, I let it be this thing that unfolds without a plan and I get the painting done, but how I get from point A of blank canvas to finish painting is like this very, um, mysterious winding road. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and my whole life is quite that way, I would say as well, where it's like, yeah, I write books and I make courses and I send out newsletters and I do all the things that entrepreneurs do, but I am, there is not a master plan. There is not, I mean, I, I hired, my assistant is a Virgo. I'll just say that. Nice. Because, <laughs> uh, and when I hired her, I, I mean, I, I made this very clear. I was like, I'm very in the moment and I change my mind a lot and I'm super creative and I need someone who can hold it together for me in, in those detailed ways, you know? And so our relationship works out really well because of, because of who we are in those ways. And she's so at this point, she's so used to me being like, actually, I'm going to totally scrap that idea. And I'm going to go with this instead. And she's like, okay, let's go, you know? (laughs) And it it takes a certain kind of person to be able to flow with a person like me too. And I, Mm -hmm. and I recognize that. So yeah, I'm, it's funny. You've mentioned many of my signs in this, you know, I'm, I'm a right on the cusp of Pisces and Aquarius for my moon. I think I'm, officially Aquarius, but it's, it's like right on the, I, someone at one point told me Pisces and then it switched. So it's right there. And I, um, I'm a Libra is my Mm -hmm. son and, um, I'm a Leo, uh, uh, rising. Mm -hmm. So I think that that helps me be, um, the Leo part helps me be like in front of people and sort of like seen as like a person who can like be the center, you know, be looked at, even though that's so not my nature. Like I'm super shy really when it comes down to it, but I'm like, thank God I have that little bit of Leo that helps me like at least come across that way. Um, 
<laughs> that's your that's but, your brave heart, right? The brave intuitive oh, painting. <laughs> exactly. But but yeah, I feel like, you know, we're all like as you know as an astrologer, it's like we're all so radically different and we just have to find like a planner type person would just be a mess living the way that I I mean it wouldn't even make sense. Yeah. Whereas I can't, you know, I can't plan tomorrow for the life of me. Like I have to I have to have this I have to have this spaciousness that we've been talking about that that's yeah. like a really important part of what I thrive on. And so I think it's really just about figuring out what we thrive on and what, you know, circling back to that idea of, I want to stay authentically interested and connected to whatever it is I'm doing. And when I start yeah. to feel myself um, not feeling that way, I know I need to make a change. And that shows up in my business all the time. Like if I've been doing a program or, or, or showing up in a certain way or even painting in a certain way, and it starts to feel like a formula or it starts to feel like, I'm just kind of going through the motions. I think we all know what that feels like, you know, where you're like, oh, I'm kind of just doing this thing that I've always done because I've always done it this way. But the inspiration has like leaked out of the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. So much of what I attribute my success as, a, as an entrepreneur to is that I've, I've, I've treated my business as a creative uh, expression, uh, as a creative process. So I'm always trying to stay connected, keep it alive, do new things, like not being afraid to change directions, um, not wanting to follow formulas of what other people are telling me to do. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. I want to... I want to, you know, stay connected to my heart first and foremost, and I want to listen to my community and then find that overlap of like, how can I serve and share in a way that feels real and true and, and, and authentic to me in a way that will be helpful, I hope, to them. And so it's, it's, and that's the same type of thing I think with my painting process is, does this feel true? Am I connected to this? Like, it's all really the same um, for me, like life, painting, business. <laughs> There's not like these big divides where I handle them in lots of different ways. It's, it's, I, I like to think it all kind of comes from a, from a similar place. Mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> so beautiful. So beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> such a medicine honestly because actually Britt and I just had a conversation about this before this podcast because we were kind of uh not posting on our sacred sister podcast Instagram for the mm. past two weeks and I said to her I just don't feel inspired and it's yeah. like and it's really hard for me to do something that I'm not inspired to do Absolutely. but then I also realize hey there is a certain consistency that is necessary and it's something that I'm still in in the midst of finding that way so that I can, whenever I send out a newsletter, whenever I make a blog post that I know, oh, I'm inspired to do this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like I'm, I write blog posts for new moon and full moon. And sometimes I'm not inspired to write this blog post until the day off the new moon and full moon. But then I'm like, Mm, that's maybe not so great for other people because they may want to already like prepare themselves for it. So it's like finding that way of, how can you find that inspiration in the flow, but still kind of plan for it at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a balance for sure. Um, but yeah, I, it's funny. I just took like 18 days off of social media too. I just mm -hmm. disappeared. I was on a trip and I just like, I was having my own experience and I like just didn't, I let it all go and it felt so good. And I did have that little voice of like, Oh, you should be posting. And then I just kept being like, you know what? no, I'm going to like live my life. And I don't think anyone else even cares, you know? <laughs> so I think we all, you know, we're this far into being connected to social media and, you know, content creators and all of that. It's like, I think there's so much fatigue happening mm. across the board. I know all my entrepreneur friends are, are <laughs> at various states of burnout. And so it's mm -hmm. like, okay, we need to create new ways of um, staying connected to our work. And if that means taking a break, take a break, you know, and, and, and show that to people, show people that we can take breaks and yeah. beautiful. 
and talk yeah. about the burnout. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It seems like this. I love, like, this is the stuff I live for. I feel like rippling through the connect- collective. I'm someone that like loves YouTube too. I, I'm, I love watching people's YouTube channels. And I feel like we started seeing this big ripple through the communities that I'm a part of, like the spiritual and the vegan communities on YouTube witnessing everyone starting to go through burnout like a year, a year and a half ago, and people starting to open up about it. And now it seems like spiritual entrepreneurs and just uh, conscious leaders, I'm witnessing the same thing on Instagram where people are starting to talk about social media addiction and taking longer breaks from social media. And it always kind of felt like uh, something that I, I felt like would not be that resonant for people. Like when I started going through this, uh, taking just that week off to go to spirit weavers, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is such a beautiful thing. I need to integrate this more, but it wasn't like a mainstream conversation yet. So I kind of just always kept it in the shadows, Mm -hmm. but it just makes me so happy that that conversation is being brought forward more. And like just how much we are missing out on in our life lives, like 3D realities whenever we are spending eight hours a day sometimes on social media and on our phones and just intaking information that other people are, are, um, are putting out there and how much it confuses our own like identity and what our own truth is sometimes. I mean, I'm, I'm super heavy Gemini in my chart and I just like live to intake other people's content and information (laughs) and it confuses the hell out of me whenever I'm doing it too much. Cause I'm like, wait, what is my truth again? Like, what do I, cause I can feel into everything that everyone is talking about. So I'm like, okay, how do I think about things? Well, yeah, that movie that just came out social dilemma. I don't know if y'all have seen it, but yes, I I, have. Yeah. I'm so glad that they made that movie because I feel like there's just this incredible amount of programming happening and the algorithms and things that we don't even, anyways, people need to watch it if they don't, if they haven't yet. But, um, what I, how I felt at the end of that movie was more committed than ever to my soul, soul practices, my, Mm -hmm. the, the things that connect me to my own truth my, my heart and what I know to be true, because there's clearly a lot of falsity in the world right now. And there's a lot of conflicting, uh, information. And that is, um, very confusing for people. And there's obviously a lot of conflict and arguments and all of that because of it. And it's like, okay, this is a call back to our own hearts. Mm -hmm. This is a call back to the things that give us uh, that are that are tangible, that are like hands in the soil or hands in the paint or with our families cooking, you know, like the real stuff, the mm-hmm. the the real human behavior <laughs> mm-hmm. that makes us feel connected to each other and to the earth and 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 to our spirit. Um, it's like that's what that's to me that's the antidote to all this mm-hmm. false new fake news and all the things that we're being fed, you know, it's like, we have got to put our devices down more, Mm -hmm. you know, we have got to bring the pendulum back to a place that makes sense with technology because we're just, we've gone down the rabbit hole, you know, and, (laughs) and it's not actually serving us as, as a, as a people. So yeah, I think that movie that movie's important to watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of those statistics about the suicide rates of young people and like, if you haven't watched it yet, it's just so, so important to, for, for, from my perspective, so important to just be intaking a lot of the information so that we're aware of what a lot of other people are going through statistically too, because I feel like I was feel I didn't learn a ton of new, new information. I already kind of intuitively yeah. felt like social media was impacting us in a lot of these ways, but it was very cool to see almost this expose type narrative from people that were on the higher ups of the social media that were helping develop these technologies. And it's yeah. just really exciting for me that like this information is being put out there for the mainstream and for like, I was watching it with my husband and he and I have known that social media is having this effect on us. And he was like, yeah, wah, wah, wah. like I already know all this stuff, but I was like, wait, is this not so inspiring for you that now this information is out there for the masses? Like we're too, yeah. we're tuned into it just because I think we 
I don't know, we have this uh, intuitive sense of how things are affecting us. So we get it, we know it on a deep level, but knowing that it's blowing the minds of like hundreds of thousands of people right now. And they're like, oh my God, like a lot of this has never occurred to them before. Yeah. (laughs) Is important. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great wake up. (laughs) Exactly. I love what you spoke on about contrast. That's like one of the things that I think has drawn me to your art in such a soulful way. Like when I think of you and your art, I think of like these palettes of contrasting colors and how much depth and like excitement it brings to like, sometimes I get in a, in a state and I'd love for you to speak on this because I'm sure you witness it in your students all the time. But sometimes I get in this state where I'm looking at a canvas and I think that there are only so many things that can happen with it. And I kind of mm-hmm. think that I've like done all the stuff, which obviously is the furthest th- thing from the truth. But it's like, do you get in those moments ever? And how do you get yourself out of them? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, it, it takes like attention. And a lot of what I offer in my classes is, you know, exercises that happen off the canvas because so often when we're in a painting, it's like, that feels like this precious space or something. And so to get people really riffing and playing and experimenting, sometimes we do some of that stuff just on paper or, you know, in a a way that it's not so precious. And so, I mean, I'm a huge fan of closing my eyes lately, whenever I do line work or shapes in my paintings, all of that starts with my eyes closed because I find that what comes through is so much more interesting than what my conscious mind and my sort of drawing skills and experience. It's just a a totally different like energy to it. I also use my non-dominant hand a lot. Um, I think I mentioned I turn my canvases upside down a lot, but I'm also, you know, trying, even as I'm moving through my life where I'm not painting, I'm, I'm trying to stay open to looking at the world with the eyes of an artist. So what I mean by that is like looking for color combinations, finding new shapes, taking photographs, making sketches, like, you know, that old school idea of like an artist that always has their sketchbook right there. It's like Mm -hmm. that, that's the thing. It's like letting there not be this big divide between our lives and our creative practices, but Mm -hmm. finding the ways in which those can inform each other and overlap makes the, it's, it's great because it makes our life like one big sort of creative experience, you know, and, and to me, that's much more interesting, but it also allows me to f- be always filling up that my, you know, metaphorical basket of ideas so that when I do step into my studio and I am standing there in front of a canvas, I'm like, oh yeah, I've got that drawing I made or that photograph, or even that conversation I had was inspiring, or I'm going to play this new playlist and see how that gets me going. You know, whatever it is, it's like, we have to like feed it. And, and I, I think of it oftentimes as like, if we're inhaling um, when we're out in life and we're like getting inspired, then when we come to the actual creative moment, we have something to exhale. And so like keeping that inhale and exhale moving and not just, you know, living our life and then expecting to just be all inspired when we step up to a canvas. It's like, it's got to be integrated on a, on a certain level. I think. I love that you just mentioned that because yeah. it's that embodiment that is so important for us to happen first in order for us to even open up the channel and allow ourselves to be in the flow because when we first say to people you know just go in front of the canvas and just let it flow you know if we're not embodied we're like what yeah. what's a flow <laughs> what's, what's that how does that work so first we need to have that you know embodiment and feeling into like really into this present moment and there's this beautiful story and I want to say that was with a very famous artist it's a story about this I don't know if it was Van Gogh but it was like a very famous artist and he was always sitting in his garden and he was just laying there chilling relaxing like letting the sun shine on him listening to the birds singing and so the neighbor comes by looks over the fence and says oh today is a relaxing day for you huh And then the artist says, no, I'm working right now. (laughs) And then the next day, the artist comes into the garden, is is like wildly just painting stuff onto the canvas and super busy. And then the the neighbor comes in and says, oh, so today is a work day for you, huh? And the artist says, 
no, I'm relaxing right now. <laughs> so, you know, that's that. like where you were breathing in. Yeah. The artist was breathing in all this present moment to allow themselves to be inspired. Then the next day to just breathe it out onto the canvas. Yeah. And that's where the flow really comes in. I love that. I love that. And I also think, you know, sometimes I'll get the question like, what, you know, how do you get inspired? And really for me, like so much of my inspiration comes from the actual act of painting. Mm -hmm. So uh, while I'm, I am trying to like fill the basket and, and be integrated in my life, you know, I, I don't wait to feel inspired to paint because, you know, that oftentimes isn't happening. But when I turn on my music and I light my candles and I open my paint jars and I start to smush the colors around on my canvas, eventually I find inspiration in the action of it, like just mm -hmm. in the doing of it. Um, and so I, th I always think that's an important thing to mention because I, I think that there's this idea that we have to be struck by inspiration and then <laughs> we run into the studio and, and act on it or something. And it's like, that happens sometimes, but for the most part, I just need to like get my butt in there and, and start you know, being in action around it. And then, and it's from that, that I'm like, Ooh, now that line that I just painted is inspiring this shape. And now that shape is inspiring this other shape. And all of a sudden I'm painting. And it's, I love that. Yeah. yeah. And I love that you were just saying too, that you create a space first, right? You create a yeah. sacred space, you put on your music, you light your candle and that in itself already gives that embodiment where we can then feel more inspired to do it. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's that's really something that I want to start implementing into my own business when I have to do things that I don't really want to do and I don't feel inspired to. I'm going to start creating yeah. a super sacred space and make it yeah. like this is my sacred altar practice now. And yeah, I'm just going to play with it and see yeah. if it's going to feel easier. I would imagine it is. It feels, it resonates very much. So I'm excited. <laughs> Beautiful. Yes. Play with that. <laughs> I feel like so much of what, Flora, you were just talking about what works for you, because obviously, you know, the music that really helps you get into that space and the candle, like I have an online course where I'm helping people carve candles with resonant symbol symbolism for them. And for me, that's, mm -hmm. I just did it again. And it's funny, I told Hannah, usually when there's some massive change in my life, it always happens around the time that I'm transitioning into a new journal and transitioning into a new altar candle or present mm -hmm. candle of presence. And it's mm -hmm. funny how that kind of thing works out. But what I kept thinking about when you were talking about that is like, you know, yourself, that's what it comes down to, you know, yourself. And for me, yeah. I, it's like astounding how many times that comes up as the answer. Cause it's like, when you know yourself, everything else kind of works itself out. And if you feel like you don't know what it is that helps you get into that state what awakens that aliveness within you? It's like Oprah says, like, that is your highest priority. That is your biggest responsibility to figure out in this life. If you do hope to have meaning and fulfillment and purpose, a sense of those things inside of this life, it's like, that's the, the guiding light. That is the guiding force to awaken the flame that is within you. That is your unique spirit. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah. I mean, this conversation, obviously, we could be here all day, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so fulfilling. I just love it. We're talking about art and life and heart, and art is in heart and in <laughs> earth. Like, it's all mixed together. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, Flora. This was absolutely amazing. I've gotten so many downloads. Remember when we said, wow, there's so many, like you, Britt, were saying, wow, we've gotten so many different downloads just from this conversation. And I looked at the clock and it was 11, 11. <laughs> That's why I was like showing. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see cities everywhere. Um, so thank well, you so much. That was thanks. so lovely. And we have for every guest, uh, we have sacred questions that we want to ask at the end of each uh, episode. And you can just, you know, answer them very quickly and short, whatever comes okay. up for you. All right. Okay. Okay. So the first is, what does sacred mean to you? Mm. Connected. Mm. And who is a sacred sister to you? And what does it mean to have a sacred sister? 
Mm. I'm going to name my dear friend Pixie Lighthorse as one of my sacred sisters. And what that, what she means to me, what that means to me is that um, we have a similar understanding of what it is to be alive um, in this moment in time. And we, uh, there's a, back to that infinity loop, there's like a loop between us where of support and understanding and compassion and inspiration that I can always count on um, with her. Mm. Beautiful. And what are some of the ways that you make something normal or mundane into something magical or sacred? Mm. That practice that we did in the beginning of just connecting to our hearts um, for me is a big one. And, and so that's something that I do when I'm like standing in the line at the grocery store or when I um, wake up in the morning before I get out of bed, I'll just put my hand on my heart and, and just, you know, getting, getting out of my head and into my heart or connecting my, connecting those two parts of myself, um, for me is sort of what unlocks the, the sacred, um, in, in, uh, in so many moments that might not, not otherwise feel that way. Beautiful. So when someone wants to get connected with you, where can they reach you? And also what's coming up for you? What are your offerings? Mm, My website is the hub, um, florabowley.com. And that's also my Instagram handle that I would say Instagram is where I hang out the most in terms of social media. Um, I have uh, quite a bit of free content um, that, Folks can access on my YouTube channel um, and also on my website, little videos and Q and A's and things like that. Um, and I have a lot of online courses. So if anyone feels like they got the painting bug um, by listening to this conversation, um, I would uh, love to invite them to check out the different offerings I have um, for online courses. Most of them are just sort of evergreen. You can join whenever and have lifetime access to them. And what's really um, on my plate right now are um, three different books, actually. I just came out with a children's book with my friend Pixie, who I was just talking about as my sacred sister. Um, we, she wrote um, the words and I did the illustrations for a children's book called Earth is Holding You, um, which we're really excited about. And that's available now. Um, and then I have my book called The Art of Aliveness that I mentioned, the, the book book um, that will be coming out in March. And um, another book called Fresh Paint that's all about finding your uh, personal painting style that'll be coming out um, in the fall of next year. So sort of the season of a new crop of of books for me. (laughs) So proud of you. Aw, thanks, girl. (laughs) So proud of you. Wow. Jeez. And the uniqueness of your work just matches the the pride that I have in you for the, (laughs) for the work that you're doing in the world. It's just so important that everyone believes that they have it in them Mm -hmm. and that they're an artist too. It's such an edge. And especially here in the Western world, it's like, I love how you were talking about the capital A artist and the differentiation that we have between the audience and the artist and how it's just time to start moving from that paradigm. Well, and one thing that I love, Britt, is that how you and I met was at a singing retreat and singing for me is my edge. That is Mm -hmm. the thing that is like terrifying. And so the (laughs) fact that I went on a singing retreat (laughs) was like me taking like my own medicine, you know, and just Mm. being like, Flora, get over your idea of not getting to be a singer. Like you're a human, you get to be a singer. So yeah. I love that. Um, that's how we met and that now we're here together. So just thank you both for having me. This has been very, um, nourishing, um, in so many ways. Really appreciated it. Yes. Thank you so much. And we want to thank you specifically personally and thank each and every one of our audience members who are still tuning in here now at the end we thank you so much we hope that you have a beautiful rest of your day and 
go and check out Flora. Go and sit with Flora in your own personal space. And I'm sure you have live workshops on hold for this time, right? Or yes, yes. We're we're waiting to see <laughs> how that looks. So yeah, stay well, tuned. Yes, it's my dream to sit with you in a live workshop one of these oh, days. I would oh, love that. Maybe Spirit that. Weaver next year. Yeah, maybe yeah. so. <laughs> fingers crossed <laughs> fingers crossed well we want to thank you so much for joining us here today flora and we hope that you have a great rest of your day as well thank mm-hmm. you you too thank, thank you so you. much namaste